Part three. When I was in my final year at the Royal Conservatory of Music, one of the works on the closing concert by the Conservatory Orchestra was a piano concerto, I think by Beethoven. The soloist was a shy young man, completely unknown, whose talent was so unmistakable that no one who heard that concert should have been the least bit surprised when he became known and acclaimed as one of the world's foremost pianists. That young man was Glenn Gould. He's no longer shy, but the rest is still there, more mature, more incisive, more masterful. Here is Glenn Gould. There are five works on tonight's program, all of them sonatas, one each by Beethoven, Scriabin, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, and two by Domenico Scarlatti. Well before the keyboard music of the Baroque began turning up with fair regularity on concert programs as it tends to nowadays, the sonatas of Scarlatti were the preferred curtain raisers for many leading soloists. Parcels of three, four, or five of these sonatas often inaugurated the sort of program that would continue with the Beethoven Moonlight or Passionata, and after intermission be given over to a grab bag of Chopin, the Barcarolle for sure, probably the Fantasy Impromptu, Liszt, Valse Oublié, and Mephisto Waltz were musts, and as the pièce de résistance, perhaps Prokofiev's Toccata Opus 7. And not only did Scarlatti's music hold its own on such occasions, it usually created through its indigenously pianistic effects a considerable furor, and the opportunity for several extra bows. It was not, of course, conceived as piano music, and yet few composers have ever written with such conspicuous flair for the keyboard. Indeed, Liszt and Prokofiev are perhaps Scarlatti's only close rivals in the maximum effect for minimum effort department. And this is all the more remarkable because, despite their many offbeat gimmicks, Scarlatti's sonatas are far from formula-proof. Most of them are in one full-speed-ahead movement, observe the inevitable binary key change, and with but few exceptions, foster their somewhat breathless virtuosity by a gabby two-part texture, which, notwithstanding octave doublings and triad fill-ins, enables Scarlatti to get about the keyboard with a dexterity and manual eccentricity matched by none of his contemporaries. Scarlatti does not develop ideas in that extensive, discursive way which was proper to his generation. He seems almost embarrassed when caught with a fugato on his hands, or when embroiled with any but the briefest stretto imitation. Most of the contrapuntal devices which help to formulate the imposing pronouncements of Bach and Handel are just baroque impedimenta to Scarlatti. He's at his happiest and best, glibly scampering from one scintillating sequence to the next, one octave to its neighbor, employing the now-current avant-garde trick of using marginal extremes in quick succession, and as a result, his music possesses a higher quirk quotient than that of any comparable figure. There's a predictable discontinuity about Scarlatti, and if his work isn't memorable in the conventional sense, if his fantastic fund of melody doesn't easily impress itself upon the listener's memory, the irrepressible vivacity and goodwill of this music ensure that just about any suite of pieces culled from those 600 sonatas will be one of the surefire delights of music. Here are two of them, the sonatas in D major and G major. <laughs>
Those were two sonatas by Domenico Scarlatti. Unlike the music of Scarlatti, that of Carl Philip Emanuel Bach encourages a most modest quirk quotient. Just one episode in the work I'm going to play in a few minutes recalls the lively anti-academicism of Scarlatti, and that a curious sequence of right-hand arpeggios with dissonant left-hand accompaniment, which concludes both halves of the final movement, seems strangely out of sync with the rest of the work. Indeed, Philip Emanuel is thought of today as a staid, stolid, eminently respectable precursor of Haydn and of Mozart. But it wasn't always so. When he published the keyboard sonatas which he dedicated to the Count of Württemberg in the year 1744, he was 30 years old, and along with his brother Willem Friedman, then drinking out of Dresden, was the toast of every tastemaker in Central Europe. He was indeed a musical swinger who latched on to all the latest fashions and himself set quite a few, exploited the glib facades of the steel galon and turned every instrumental trick described in his own and other people's manuals. But not even the emphasis which record companies and archivists generally have lately placed upon that intriguing twilight era which separates the spiritual grandeur of Bach Sr. and the earthly magnificence of the Viennese classicists like Mozart, and during which the younger Bachs were so influential a force, can fully refurbish the reputation of Philip Emanuel, or do more than recall through a veil of nostalgia the eminence that once was his. Yet even if the future was not with K.P.E. Bach... K.P.E. Bach was with the future. However beset by orthodoxy those modulatory conventions of his may now seem, they were once part of a desperate and radical rush to modernity, and upon their clichés, upon their rudimentary virtuoso flourishes, their rapidly crystallizing chord changes and cadence fixtures, the strong, deft outlines of the classical symphony were built. There are, to be sure, times when Bach looks backward as well as to the future, when some momentary developmental stress compels him to use counterpoint, not as his father used it, perhaps, but as more than just a remembrance of things past, certainly. And had there been more such moments, had Philip Emanuel been able to step outside the preoccupations of his generation, to be less aware of the main chance, the fast route to public favor, to be, as his father was, a man apart, he might have blessed all that contemporaneous concern which drove him with a genuine and generous awareness of the timelessness of art and of his responsibility to it. The Sonata in A minor, the first of the so-called Württembergische Sonatas, by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. That was the first of the Württembergische Sonatas by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. Beethoven's two-movement sonata, Opus 78, vies with the so-called light or easy works, sonatinas really, published as his Opus 49, for the honor of being shortest among his keyboard sonatas. It requires less than seven minutes to play, but it's far from light and easy, and is in fact a remarkable miniature which synopsizes most of the design problems of which Beethoven was concerned during the period of its composition. Like the Eighth Symphony, written three years later in 1812, it offers a deceptively classic and unruffled facade, the better to disguise some ingenious, if unostentatious, moments of invention. There's a relaxed and fluid quality about this work, which, again like the Eighth Symphony, seems to lend itself to mild, ironic twists, deliberate asymmetries, and abortive upbeats inexplicably left without a phrase to follow them. All in all, it's a relaxed, good-humored put-on of the formal rigors subscribed to by the classical sonata, from which straitjacket Beethoven was about to escape. The Sonata in F-sharp major, opus 78.
That was the sonata in F-sharp major, opus 78, by Beethoven. The development of Russian music in the 19th century can be divided into three distinct phases. Phase one was the import era, the consequence of all those court-sponsored productions of Italian opera and French farce which constituted salon culture, Petersburg style, circa 1800. This phase culminated with the early works of Michael Glinka, those facile compots of the allegro furioso gallops of middle period Beethoven, the harmonic method of Ludwig Spohr, and the better tunes of Fanny Mendelssohn. All that Tsar Peter had commended to his people was accomplished. Their music, like their architecture, had become a pale yet impeccable copy of the best that the West could use no longer. Glinka's career provided a bridge to phase two, that brooding identity quest which distinguished the work of his immediate successors, among them men like Modest Mussorgsky with his singular search for the Russian soul. His instincts were those of the coffee house aesthete, the good-hearted but irrevocably dissolute fellow who in rare moments of lucidity could seize some noble idea and uninhibited by considerations of technical accomplishment, set it down in one mad burst of creative enthusiasm. Mussorgsky, for all the unashamed awkwardness of his style, was Russia's musical coming of age. Then, overlapping with Mussorgsky, came the third phase, the export generation. The most successful artist of the period, and indeed the only Russian composer of his time with a universal appeal, was, of course, Tchaikovsky, a man of absolutely superior facility, he could use or disdain the influence of the nationalists like Mussorgsky, as occasion demanded, and he remains to this day Russian music's chief tourist attraction. Tchaikovsky's career was a triumphant refutation of the concept of Russian insularity, an argument similarly propounded by such 20th century cosmopolites as Serge Prokofiev. Yet the dour ruminations of Russian music had not yet found an end, and in a certain sense the party-line protocol of the post-revolutionary generation is a throwback to and or extension of the Mussorgskian quest. But straddling some fine personal line, a few Russian artists have managed to combine the introspection of Mussorgsky and the extroversion of Tchaikovsky in a style which perhaps because of that uneasy alliance can best be described as mystic. And chief among these is the composer of the final work on tonight's program, Alexander Skriabin, whose third piano sonata I'm going to play now. Scriabin was 25 when he wrote this piece in 1897 and on the brink of some of the most fascinating harmonic experiments attempted in modern times. But unlike his later work, including the last half dozen of his ten piano sonatas, which through a curious blend of determination and spontaneity explore an attitude to harmony and its interaction with melodic figuration, which supplements, if it doesn't exactly foreshadow the work of Arnold Schoenberg, the third sonata is an exercise in more conventional design. Though a work of only moderate length, its running time is slightly over 20 minutes, the four movements of this sonata offer a profile of imposing gravity, without at any time, barring perhaps a few sequences in the finale, confusing busyness with complexity, size with grandeur, or repetition with unity, as the sonatas and symphonies of such more recent Russian composers as Miaskovsky and Shostakovich tend sometimes to do. According to many analysts, the early work of Scriabin betrays the influence of Chopin, a fondness for languorous cantilenas and noodling alto-tenor figurations. But if it does, then surely Chopin, with a difference. The worthy Frederick scarcely ever kept a large-scale structure going with the impetus Scriabin gives to this sonata, solving the architectural problems implicit in interpretive vibrato, embroidering with intra-paragraph ambiguity the sure, clean key shifts of his primary modulations. The first movement of the work is typical. It's an expansive and declamatory sonata allegro in which the bittersweet nostalgia of the secondary thematic group is held in check by the foreboding double-dot interpolations of the primary theme's chief rhythmic component. It's music to read Wuthering Heights by, an hypnotic, self-centered piece of doom foretelling. The second movement is a scherzo with an angular bar-line defying primary motive in the left hand and a Vincent Dandy-like series of harmonic twists in both. In the third movement, Scrobin turns that unerring harmonic sense of his to the task of undercutting the expected cadential climaxes. Whenever the gelatinous post-Wagnerian chromatic texture leads one to anticipate an emphatic Heldenlebenish climax, Scrobin demurely steps aside, reiterates the just-concluded phrase with elaborations, just so that he can step aside again. There's a remarkable, almost Pavlovian insight into the psychology of denial in this music, 
Despite all euphonic resemblance, it's the antithesis of the quasi-improvisatorial method of Richard Strauss. Even if on first hearing it does suggest the sound of cocktail our piano is played in all the better bars on 59th Street. And I said to her, Marsha, my dear, the outfit is absolutely stunning. Uh, waiter, check please. Yeah, well, Harry, as I see it, uh, J.D. is on his way out at Consolidated Cornerstone. Anyway, there's no talking allowed by Scriabin's finale. An elaborate treatise on the vertical possibilities of a rhythmic continual. Here's the third piano sonata by Alexander Scriabin. You have been listening to the Sonata in F-Sharp by Alexander Scriabin, the final work on this recital especially recorded for the CBC by Glenn Gould. The program was prepared in Toronto by Richard Coulter. That brings to a close this edition of CBC Thursday Music.